Okay, then. We are live with the latest episode of, well, an absolutely historic moment, not just in the world of geopolitics, but certainly in the World Metal Congress as well. We're joined by Lena, uh, one of the co-founders of World Metal Congress. Lena, how are you doing? And where are you in the world these days? I am fine, thank you. And I am currently joining you from Beirut. Fantastic. Well, um, as, as ever, um, you know, we try and cross as many time zones as possible. And uh, so pleased to see people joining us um, for what I'm sure is going to be a very stimulating conversation. For people that don't know what World Metal Congress is all about, could you, could you just walk us through how, how it came about? Why have we done this thing? Well, we did it because we recognize that metal is truly global and that there's a lot of talent around the world that perhaps is not well connected or even recognized sometimes. And we also wanted to shed light on key issues that are of relevance to the uh, metal scene, whether fans or uh, industry experts or um, musicians. We wanted to bring them all together to meet one another and talk about things that matter. And I guess that's one thing we're doing tonight. Indeed. Well, you know, uh, I guess to, to put things mildly, these are um, historic times you could say. Um, I mean, this episode is actually, it's, it's not just topical and um, timely, um, but it's, it's on the eve of an incredible transition of power that I think um, to, to try and put in a nutshell, um, people attempted to afford it, you know? And uh, I suppose you could say we were, we were surprised and possibly depressed to learn that, um, you know, one of the luminaries in the actual world of metal you know, was photographed seemingly participating in those activities, you know, John Schaefer of Iced Earth, you know, um, which I guess, Lena, for background on this episode, it, it, it made us ask the question, does, does, does metal have a problem when these things appear in our ranks? And um, I guess we have some pretty interesting people joining us to kind of help us flesh out what I think is an important conversation and what's a timely conversation. So walk us through who's joining us tonight, if you would. Yeah, I mean, tonight we're going to talk about a rather thorny topic. As you said, what happened on January 6 in the United States led us to think about extremism in all its forms and its relationship uh, to the metal scene, whether positively or negatively. So we're going to be joined by Elena Goodman, who is the deputy editor of Metal Hammer magazine. And um, she would be an authority to talk about especially how um, a magazine like Metal Hammer representing the metal media uh, deals with this very delicate issue. And we're also joined by Philly Byrne, uh, who is from the thrash metal band uh, Gamma Bomb, but at the same time, he has had a long career in the social media and media and is also someone who can speak very authoritatively um, on the issue. Indeed, and um, it is a big issue, um, and as you say, it's a thorny one. So I think without further ado, we should bring Philly and Eleanor in so we can get into the next 60 minutes of, um, of stimulating debate. And um, we're just gonna see if they can connect. We are live, of course. So um, I fully expect the whole system to fall down. We'll see where we are. All right, Philly, how are you doing? Are you receiving? Hi, how are you doing? Live and clear, loud and clear, rather. Hi. Fantastic. Hi. Eleanor, can you give us a check one, two? It's, it's a Check bell. one, two. Fantastic. <laughs> all right, well, we're all here. Guys, um, Welcome to the chat. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to, to have you here. Um, we were just foregrounding the conversation because there's there's so much to get into what is a multifaceted uh, conversation. You know, um, you know I, I guess it's no surprise to anyone that, you know, the metal community is very much a cross section of society. And so you're going to get all sorts, you know, but, um, you know, uh, for people that aren't necessarily aware, um, you know, uh, Lena's day job, you could say, when she's not doing World Metal Congress, you know, um, as uh, I guess the, uh, uh, the head of the Middle East program at Chatham House, you know, you know, perhaps the, the world's foremost think tank. Um, I mean, Lena, you're, 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 you're kind of an expert in, in the field of, I, I guess what you could say is extremism. And of course, it's a startling thing to kind of think that the sort of things that we associate with ISIS, perhaps, seem to be appearing in our midst um, in the States as well, and even in the metal community also. So, so just to kind of frame the conversation before we dive into to, to current events, when we say extremism, what are we talking about? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to come up with a definition of extremism as such, but I will say 
that very often when people think of extremism, they think sadly the Middle East or these places away from us, you know, in the West where people engage in kind of unacceptable behavior that is threatening to others, that uses violence to achieve goals that are against democracy and against peace and stability. And the thing is, unfortunately, this kind of behavior exists everywhere. Unfortunately, in every country on the planet, there is a form of extremism. And it doesn't all have to be about religion. It could be political extremism, social extremism. And, uh, you know, as, as we saw in the United States, even at the heart of a very democratic uh, country that is considered a leader in the world when it comes to democracy, even extremism of that kind can exist. And uh, so, of course, what happened on January 6 is really unfortunate. But to me, I have to say, it's not necessarily surprising because I had no illusions that these kinds of humans exist everywhere. Indeed. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that's one of the uh, most important points um, I think yet we can make tonight is, um, you know, we're focusing on, you know, uh, a phenomenon that, that, that no country uh, no, no culture is immune to, you know, um, you know, and I think that um, in the sort of uh, the, the debate that ensued that erupted, not just, you know, globally, but also on metal Twitter, um, as you could say, a lot of really important and interesting things were being said, um, you know, uh, uh, in response to one DJ in particular, um, over in the States, you know, who was kind of saying, well, you know, metal should find some common ground, you know, let's not concentrate on the things that divide us and so on. And I mean, Philly and Eleanor, I mean, you, you, you know, the exchange that I'm talking about. I mean, it, it, you know, I, I don't want to uh, drop people in without having the, the right to reply, but what went through your head when you read that statement that perhaps we should try and find some common ground with people that are clearly, you know, I guess you could say a little out there to put it mildly. I was really shocked, first of all, um, because I think, he was coming from a place of good intentions where he was saying, oh, let's all get together and be friends, basically. But having seen what I saw on TV and having read about it and just watching it all unfold, I was just really shocked that he would say that when the situation was clearly so extreme. And there was clearly a lot of hatred around. I mean... Um, you know, for these people to have the impetus to go and storm the Capitol building, <clears throat> excuse me, and to see some of the clothes and things that people were wearing, allusions, is, allusions to Auschwitz and so on. I was just kind of shocked and I just thought, I feel like I need to say something because it's not good enough just to say, let's all be friends. When some of these people have so much hatred in them, they don't want people to exist anymore. You know, they want to kind of... Um, take away people's dignity or freedoms or rights um, through the, what they're doing and so I just felt like it wasn't strong enough to say let's come together and I think the point that I made was that um, as Lena was just saying extremism is everywhere in the world and so for me um, a lot of people talk about the metal scene being very inclusive and it really is inclusive it's one of the reasons why I love it there's so much good that happens. People really pull together. People are really accepting. There's all kinds of stuff that goes on and people like being a part of it. But I think some of that inclusivity can blind people to the fact that because the metal scene is a microcosm of the wider world, there are still these elements that exist in it. And I think especially um, in metal, obviously it's predominantly white men, obviously not all of it, but I think for some of those people who might be well-meaning, they can't see these problems because they feel included and it's fine for them. So they just kind of don't realize what might exist inside the metal scene. So I was just a little bit shocked when I saw it and I just felt like I had to say something really. Yeah. yeah, yeah I, 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 please sorry, go, go ahead, Billy. Um, well, yeah. it, it, it came as surprise, it precisely zero surprise to me uh, to read a statement like that. I think as Eleanor says, look, it comes from what is essentially probably a kind hearted place, but I think, um, you know, as, as a veteran of making kind of progressive political statements in a genre that doesn't always welcome it, I absolutely am completely familiar with that reaction. The, hey guys, you know, I think my reaction to it was something like, why can't us and the fascists all just listen to hate breed together and chill? It's like, you know, to, to 
to create a false equivalence um, between two ends of a political spectrum, one of which is act- actively trying to kill people and the other one, which is about maybe, I don't know, maybe maybe violently or, or divisively um, attempting to secure or gain ground for a, for a group of people. I think um, <clears throat> to, to say, um, why can't we all just get together and, and pick flowers is a problem because if we encourage that behavior, if we, if we okay that mindset, what happens is you eventually get to the point where it boils over into the events like happened at the Capitol building. I think things like that are only possible when there isn't a day-to-day check on your behavior by people you either, not check on your behavior, but a day-to-day influence put in place either by people you look up to or by your peer group and things like that. You know, I, I think um, the, hey, can't we all just clap hands? It's useless in the face of people who actually want to, um, who actually want to harm people, you know? I think it's okay if you're saying like, you guys like death metal, us guys like thrash metal. That's okay. There are times in life we can go, lads, shut up, let's just have a beer kind of thing. Um, but I think when it comes to things like this that are actually injurious to human uh, dignity and, and peace, um, I don't think there's much room. Yeah, you know, it's interesting um, that, that you say that because, um, I mean, the, the, the statement that really caused this furore and, uh, you know, it's a Twitter pile on um, by any standards, you know, and I think rightly so, you know, because it was just uh, ill-timed, ill-judged. Say like common ground equals heavy music. Let's focus on what we all hold close to our heart. And for us metalheads, it's our music. What happens when someone falls in the mosh pit? Do we ask them? who they favor politically, or do we just automatically pick them up and continue rocking? Mm-hmm. Which, you know, I suppose, as we've just said that, you know, the male community is a cross section of society. So it's not surprising to see extremist elements in it. It's also not surprising to see the same political narrative that's appeared in the States, which is that to impeach Trump is to be divisive. And it's like, hang on a minute. No, we have to call this out. We have to react to this because it's probably that sort of join hands together attitude that has sort of gotten us to where we are because yeah, yeah. we failed to recognize something that is abhorrent and intolerable. You know. Yeah, um, I think you know. I think when you both sides a situation like this, you basically give power to the more aggressive group. Is what you do. You know, when when you and and you know it's it's like in in the comments again you can see a cross section in the comments and the replies to the kind of things we post on social media there'll always be a couple of people who are like i hate extremists of all kinds and it, it's either an intellectual dishonesty pre you know kind of uh positing things to either end of an imaginary seesaw that makes the argument impossible and therefore negates it in order to favor the people they like or it's just not thinking about it hard enough <laughs> that's the two places that comes from i like to give people the benefit of the doubt you know um that there is always room to there is always room to kind of convince people a bit more that there are that there are more stringent ways of um, communicating and changing the world as opposed to just going let's all uh, get along, which basically means let's let the bodies win. Yeah, I mean, I was just keeping an eye on the on the chat here on YouTube as as uh, you know we're we're talking and someone I like this term calls it toxic positivity when you're trying to. Uh, <laughs> when you're trying to just let's just all get along and uh you know um everything is kind of fine um it's paradoxical and i and i like that term so thanks for the contribution to the discussion indeed. to the person who posted that indeed um yeah i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna steal that because that's a, that's a great way i think of framing this um and it's been echoed in some of the other comments we've um we've received online um um Jesus, from Colombia um, wrote in to say this, there is a serious problem in metal and it is that this false belief that metal is total freedom, that we have to accept all positions and opinions. It's one of those fallacies of democracy where in order that supposedly all opinions are respectable, we have to live with issues such as racism, machismo and sexism and indeed fascism. He goes on a little bit, you know, but I think what he's really talking about there is uh, you know, Karl Popper's, you know, paradox of tolerance, which is that in order to live in a free and democratic society that upholds free speech, that we should be tolerant of all views, where, of course, the paradox there is, um, you know, you end up opening the gates to intolerable views, you know, ones that we shouldn't accept. And so, again, we're not really talking about metal here. We're talking about problems endemic to society mm-hmm. in general, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, everybody loves to talk about the marketplace of ideas, but just because everybody has the ability to say something doesn't mean that it goes unchallenged. And I think that's the point. I think you have to, especially especially if you're in a position, like say you're a publisher or, you know, you're a Chatham House, or even if you're in a, a little metal band nobody's ever heard of, you need, to, you need to use whatever platform and voice you have in order to 
I don't know, try to in some way steer uh, steer that marketplace uh, towards the ideas that are less harmful, you know, that are that do better for the the, ma- the majority of people, you know. Indeed. So, if, if I could ask, um, you know, so we, you know, um, we've elevated this, you know, I think to you know just some very, you know, uh, deep philosophical, you know, questions, you know, um, but just just in terms of like the, the visceral experience, Eleanor, what went through your head when you saw a picture of John Schaefer? Um, you know, uh, in front of a bunch of police people inside the U.S. Capitol wearing an Oath Keeper's hat. I mean, what was your immediate reaction when you saw that? Just thought it was really surreal. And um, I'm not the biggest Ice Earth fan. The first thing I did, I saw it on Twitter and somebody had gone, oh, I think John Schaefer's in the Capitol building. And probably like everyone that night, I had CNN open, PBS open on my computer and I was scrolling on Twitter and I was WhatsApping all my friends. And this picture came up and I was like, this is crazy. And so... Yeah, Google image search matched up with him, was texting people. And I think, again, with what Lena was saying, it's just that you kind of know that these extremist elements exist, but it brought it home for me to see somebody from our world, as we would call it, inside the building. Um, And the fact that they all just got in there basically unchallenged. And it was like watching some kind of film or something. And, you know, Philly, you said you weren't surprised about the comment on Twitter and I can see why. Um, And, you know, watching things unfold, I could see why this was happening, but it was still, it still felt quite surreal to watch and especially when his face cropped up. Yeah, like I said, it kind of brings it home and you just think, wow, like it's everywhere. (laughs) Um, Elena, can I I ask you as an editor of the world's most eminent uh, metal magazine, what editorial decision will you take now regarding this person, um, the band perhaps? I mean, the band members issued a statement, um, we have to say, uh, saying, you know, they distanced themselves from the actions of of John Schaefer. Um, So what editorial decision do you think you you will take? And have you ever been in this position before with anybody else? Um, well, the only thing I can think of is a similar but different situation. You know, I hate to bring up the name Lost Profits, but, you know, it's obviously not quite the same situation. But that was a situation where somebody was, you know, obviously you, we just wouldn't have ever covered them again. I wasn't at Hammer at the time. I was at a different magazine. But there's no question that, you know, that was completely untouchable. Um, but I remember being at the magazine and we did actually cover um, his band members' new band because the signs pointed towards, they were completely disgusted and had no idea this was going on. And um, they just wanted to completely distance themselves from it and do another band entirely. So I remember there was some coverage of that band because um, they weren't involved in any of those proceedings. And that whole thing was obviously completely abhorrent. Um, And I think there's no question that you know, we don't want to cover John Schaefer because he's crossed a line, done something, you know, domestic terrorism. It's it's something that he's going to be answerable to. You know, he's been, well, I think he's handed himself in. Um, he was wanted by the FBI. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think we would want to cover him now. I think, what we're, I think what you're seeing with somebody like Schaefer, though, he is just one example of the Facebook dads the generation of Facebook dads who have been blinded by nonsense and weaponized by lies and then turned loose on their own families, their own communities, and ultimately on the state that they live in, in this case. You know, I think he literally is the picture of the Facebook dad. You know, what is man in his 50s out wearing this hat, belonged to this fringe group, clearly marinated in extreme right-wing views that he's been picking up in a filter bubble over the last 10 years in a completely unregulated space online. It, you know, again, it, it comes as no surprise that he's doing this. I suppose one upside is that, you know, apart from this incident, as, as far as I'm aware, he's not hugely currently relevant or covered anyway. But it, yeah, to, to see somebody like that out there and actually in the Capitol building, <clears throat> I think it was, it should be a wake up call for everybody that what's happening on the internet isn't a game. This isn't LARPing. This isn't, uh, as the far right would like you to believe, a series of uh, a matryoshka doll of, of knowing memes and jokes and winks. Uh, it, it is actually um, an ideology that can lead to behavior, like to to violent, extreme behavior. 
And 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 I think not to take us off in another direction, but I actually think that's one of the it's probably the big risk nobody saw coming out of the internet that the primordial kind of soup that started with chat rooms could actually breed extremism. You know, like look at Shamima Begum who went off to ISIS. That was all communication online and grooming that allowed that to happen. Do you know what I mean? So it's the same thing here, whether it's John Schaefer or those girls who went to ISIS. It's like you go online, people pour poison into your ear and you either have the media literacy and the awareness and the intelligence to get around it or you don't. Indeed, you know, and, uh, you know, I think it's very well stated because clearly, you know, there is a process of radicalization, you know, that, that happens online. And, um, you know, uh, someone has very uh, rightly pointed out that, um, you know, there's a side project that John Schaefer specifically had called Sons of Liberty that, you know, perhaps if you look at it, you know, critically now in light of, you know, events, it's just like well, the warning signs there. Uh, and and you, you ask yourself, and I suppose, is there something that kind of uh, makes the world of metal vulnerable simply because this is uh, an art form, you know, a, a form of self-expression that, you know, by its definition deals in provocation. I mean, were you to go back to Black Sabbath, literally just like it was not just the music, but also their notoriety and who it seemed to piss off um, that really kind of, you know, gave them their platform and their attraction. Now, um, this is a thing that, you know, is uh, you know, a, a one-time editor at Metal Hammer, you, you wrestle with all the time, you know, but I mean, is that something, is that a blind spot, you know, um, in our world? Is that something that creates a special vulnerability because we're probably less prone to question some of the lyrics and conceptual themes that people deal with? Anybody? <laughs> I'm going to defer to Elner on that because she actually is a, an editor at the biggest metal magazine. <laughs> so you're talking about... Um you know, is metal an art form that lends itself to this kind of exploration and provocation of things and how do we respond to that? Um, and yeah, it's traditionally being viewed as outsider music, um, working class roots, um, you know, Black Sabbath, if you take them as the godfathers of metal, they were writing about um, war, you know, war pigs. It was political from the beginning in that sense. And it is a space where you find more provocative topics than in mainstream pop, for example. Um, but it spans a range of topics. Um, I guess if you're asking if this is an art form where extremism can proliferate more easily, um, then potentially yes, just because there are more, um, there's more of kind of an underground network, an underground scene and, um, Again, as I mentioned, you know, if you're talking about the stereotypical metaler, it's probably going to be a white guy. You call John Schaefer a Facebook dad, you know, probably a white guy, sort of 30 to 60, potentially. Um, so, but, you know, maybe metal, you know, maybe there is more of a potential for there to be a problem in metal than another art form. I could yeah. definitely see that. And, and I think the theatricality of metal is another way that this kind of thing happens, you know, like... Obviously, in all genres of music, people assume characters and and sort of have a narrative aspect to things. <clears throat> but I think heavy metal is particularly theatrical, and constructs are a big part of what makes it a thing. That's why it's for nerds. It's it's very imaginative music, and I think you know, obviously, my band of lyrics that don't reflect, uh, you know, what I think they're stories where you assume a character, and I I think in a way that can create a space in which it can suddenly be okay. I mean, it should be okay. You know, like to be honest, I'll defend to the death the right. Uh, the right to write songs people don't like because that's what I've done for nearly 20 years. But um, I think it does create a space in which um, we can be second guessing ourselves so much about the authenticity of the messages that we hear that it can just allow for anything to happen, you know? Um, and, and look, I'm not saying that there needs to be an answer to that. I think it's totally fine um, for somebody to write a song like Guilty of Being White or whatever that I completely disagree with as long as it is understood that you can completely disagree with that and that it can be understood by people as a flawed message um, being delivered by somebody who doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> but I do, I do think heavy metal allows room for it. Yeah, it's it's extreme music, it's passionate, it's aggressive, it's confrontational, it's highly imaginative. There's also a, demogra a, a demographic aspect to it. Obviously World Metal Congress is uh, highlighting to everybody that it isn't the case the world over, but it, it was founded by and is largely still run by white lads and I think there's a demographic thing there. You look at funk music or hip hop, there, there are aspects of extreme political views in those, but they will probably flow in the opposite direction. They'll, they'll probably flow in a, 
in a you know extremely left wing or or liberal or a Black Panther or an aggressive kind of you know a, aggressive uh, Black nationalist direction as opposed to what you'll find in in this music. So it's not I don't believe it's unique to heavy metal, but I do think that the you know I think the predominance of lads like this uh, might have something to do with it. <laughs> but I mean. Um... One uh, metal musician that I know once uh, made the um, comparison between film and metal by saying uh, to people who don't know what heavy metal is or find it scary, he said, you know, do you watch horror films? A lot of people said, yeah, we enjoy them. And he said to them, well, just imagine that this is the musical equivalent. Um, of horror films yeah which means just because you know you watch a horror film and you enjoy it doesn't mean that you want to inflict violence on other people Mm -hmm. (laughs) and i think if you see metal in that regard it also makes sense you may sing about terror and war and perhaps glorify them in your lyrics but that does not mean you are inciting people to um violence or that you want to engage in violence uh yourself i mean um, you know, Philly, for example, your band, I mean, you know, some of the <laughs> some of the album titles or song titles that you guys have made, you know, for example, the Terror Tapes, right? 2013. And actually, I was I was, um, you know, in preparing for this episode, thinking to myself, let me let me see, you know, if these guys had anything to say. Uh, in a more literal way about what we are talking about today. And I thought, wow, the terror tapes, that is it. I'm going to delve into the lyrics. Actually, I found something which is not, um, you know, necessarily, I'm going to read it out, just um, a, a couple of lines. At the end of a song called Metal Idiot, which should be, I think, the theme song for tonight's episode, <laughs> um, the lyrics say, if anybody says you're preaching, tell them silence is consent. The voice of reason is a weapon. You've just got to use it with just one intent. The paranoia, persecution, preconception, don't be in any doubt. You've got to say, fuck them, stamp out. So this is a very clear message to basically say, if you spot something that is not right, you should be vocal and say something about it. So what motivated you to write that? Yeah, well, uh, I have to say, Lena, you your voice sounds much nicer than it than my Northern Irish goose honk sounds on that album. Um, yeah, well, look, I mean, it's like we, we, you know, we as a band have always done this kind of thing. Um, and the gas thing is um, when we, I'll, I'll give you the long answer and the short answer. The long answer is when we started the band uh, in 2002, we were we wrote some songs that had kind of a you know a you know progressive political slant to them, but we were actually doing it as a kind of a throwback, a fetish to bands like Nuclear Assault and Anthrax, who were writing quite right on music in the eighties. We literally just thought, oh, this is a thing bands like this do. Obviously, we we weren't racists or whatever, so we were like, that's cool, let's write songs about that. The the, the depressing thing is the internet has made it apparent that that these things actually still are issues on a massive scale. So what what began actually as a kind of a, a, a retro songwriting fetish actually is a very core part of, of I think of one of the more positive things we do. Metal Idiot, that song itself is, I'm actually glad you brought that one up because we have quite a few songs like that, but that one's particularly relevant. We played a festival in Southern Italy um, with Vader and we played one of our other anti-fascist songs called Mussolini Mosh and Men in the Crowd um, uh, were confrontational with us. There was there was you know some uh, aggro on stage with them, and then after the gig we had to get like corralled by security into a, a dressing room because apparently there were people with knives in the crowd looking for us and all this kind of thing, you know. And and the hilarious thing was the security guards who marched us to the dressing room. We were saying, well, thanks, this is weird, but thank you. And then they turned around and did a fascist salute as they closed the door. So it's just like I felt like I was lost in a bird's nest of idiots, you know. So the the song was kind of a, about that, and I think what that situation proved and it was by no means a a very it was by no means a massive risk to our physical safety it it just kind of showed you that it it is worth um it is worth taking a stand on these things that song is very much um that song has an element of fence sitting as a crime in it you know and i think um that experience really showed me that because to be honest at the time I was a bit scared it was a bit like what what's happening here we're being literally corralled in by men and marched you know marched into this football stadium to get away from people and it did kind of make me just go right okay there is a price to be paid for uh having an opinion which means it's probably a very good idea to have and be brave about that opinion you know 
nobody cares what color grips you like. Some people react very violently when you say that they shouldn't uh, persecute people for the color of their skin. And I think that says a lot about what the danger of that thought is, you know? Um, so yeah, yeah, we've, we've always written songs. We've always written songs like that. We always have. You know, and um, something, um, you know, that I wanted to follow up on just what you just said, like dangerous thoughts, you know, um, uh, because, you know, uh, something that's come up a few times in this conversation and I'm just really remarking on is how many parallels there are between this, us talking about metal as a microcosm, how many parallels there are between this and this sort of national and international debate that is now going on about, you know, deplatforming, what are the implications for freedom of speech, all these things. Now, I wanted to bring in the chat a little bit um, because we have a great series of interactions that are happening and uh, it's so great to kind of see that happening because that's that's why we do this um you know and um horrible charlotte her her name not mine <laughs> i didn't call her horrible charlotte um she said something one thing we need to stop doing is blindly saying that metal is the most inclusive place i hear it all the time when we talk about women in metal just before people start telling a string of awful anecdotes mm-hmm. um she says while metal critique society it also it it took on certain norms on the wholesale patriarchy, for example, some things go unquestioned because privilege is unseen when you live in it. And I I wanted to raise that because it chimes with something brilliant that I read from Serena um, of Svalbard uh, who tweeted in response to that, you know, provocation that we're referencing. Um, And I think she said something very similar. You know, metal is just a music genre. It is not a utopian community. Metal does not override racism. Metal does not override sexism. Metal does not override homophobia. Metal does not override transphobia. Metal will never be more important than the fight against fascism, which I thought was a great encapsulation, you know, because I guess while on the one hand, we want to call out, you know, you know, John Schaefer um, and, uh, you know, just like, you know, all that ilk. I mean, what we can really do is I guess police internally, you know, I guess an even more dangerous thing, which I guess is a microcosm of what's happening in the States right now is just because you say this is the land of the free and that, you know, this is the land of democratic rights to free speech and all that, doesn't matter how many times you say it, unless you actually practice it, um, mm-hmm. it doesn't make it more true, you know? And so if you are living in a society that's permissive about extremist intolerable beliefs and so on, it doesn't matter what you call yourself or what you proclaim to be, yeah. um, you know, those things will win out. So is that the danger in the world of metal? I guess we're talking about a bit of handholding before. Is that is that where we need to kind of stop saying that we're a, a, just a utopian community that's somehow immune to, to the same problems that society has? What, what do you think, Eleanor? Yeah, that was definitely what I was trying to touch on in my response that we were talking about earlier to um, the DJ's tweet is that, you know, like you said, we can say we're inclusive, but it doesn't erase the fact that there are problems, Um, you know, in terms of sexism and racism and so on. It's just, um, you know, I agree and I agree that we need to call them out and shine a light on them. And unfortunately, the people that are often um, the victims of these thoughts, opinions, belief, actions don't always have a voice to do it which is something that philly touched on as well and so then it becomes about allyship and about calling things out when you see them or as you said using your platform to create change and um you know bands do this really well as well you see some brilliant bands like fever 333 who aren't strictly kind of metal metal but what they do is they'll go on stage and not only is their music um political anyway they get on stage and they kind of do speeches before songs and they say this is an inclusive space um you know we're here for everyone to have a good time we support women we support people of color they actually make a point of doing that so that everybody there feels safe who's gone to the gig um and you see other but other bands doing that as well i think they're kind of the most um prominent example of that because their whole the whole platform of them being a band is to try and bring more equality so they're very kind of on it when it comes to that. But I think it can really help um, for people just to say that because it just makes people feel more included, just calling things out and saying things, um, definitely. Yeah, I think, you know, heavy metal is, you know, I, I've been amazed at some of the people that I've met going around the world playing heavy metal. And there definitely are moments where I felt like, wow, because heavy metal is a place adjacent to the mainstream, or quite far removed from it. <clears throat> I have seen it as I have seen it as a place of retreat for people who otherwise can't be can't can't find an easy place. Um, you know, particularly I've seen it as a place where people with disabilities, physical disabilities, 
and learning disabilities find incredible solace, which is really amazing. And I do think obviously when you travel the world, as World Mail Congress does celebrate, people of every stripe and every color enjoy it, which is brilliant. But I think when you talk about it as an actual global industry and community, I, I think at, at its core, it's still very pale, male and stale. And I think moreover, uh, you know, and this is a slightly different thing that, that my band were touching on after the capital thing kicked off. I don't think we can address those problems within heavy metal until we address the uh, attention and veneration that we still give to people who represent all the worst parts of that. And that's not just, you know, given out to media or whatever. I think there are just, you know, we've, we've built creation myths around people who stabbed a guy to death for being gay. You know, we continue, it's not just publishers, by the way, Eleanor, it's, it's like people on Instagram and everywhere else to like champion and yo bro people who were doing Hitler salutes on stage a couple of years ago. You know, like <clears throat> bands with homophobic lyrics totally passed under the bridge. You know, we're, we're, we're still giving mad props to all these people because they happen to shift units or because they have tunes that are good. And, and here's the thing, you can't, you can't rewrite history. You can't make people not be idiots. And there is a degree of like, yep, Frank Sinatra's songs are great. What was Frank Sinatra like as a person? And that's a real thing too. But I'm talking about a different thing where we're continuously live now as a culture, lionizing people who are still around being a problem. You know, people who treat women like meat, um, people who are overtly racist in their lyrics. And I think, <clears throat> I think until there is a bit more, until there is a bit more conversation around that, and I'm not saying people need to be pilloried, I just think there needs to be conversation around that, you know? Um, at the minute, all there is is a minority of people pointing that out and then been getting slapped down by whatever community they happen to pop up in. And I think that's a sign of a problem, you know? Elena, can I just add to that a question to you, which is about a delicate issue for a lot of media outlets, which is that of Phil Anselmo. Oh. I know this is in no way equivalent to what John Schaefer has done. So let's just clarify that. The, the guy, Phil Anselmo, did not engage in any crime, no. but there is the controversial issue of the white power incident, followed by a degree of what I can see redemption, which has meant that the media still, uh, you know, generally cover um, Phil Anselmo's work. So how have you handled that issue? We've not spoken to Phil Anselmo since the white power incident. So um, Alex will remember actually that when it happened, we tried to get in contact with him to try and have a chat with him, do an interview, see what had actually happened, and then kind of decide what to do with that material once we'd got it and depending on how it went. Mm. And he replied through his people, presumably saying that um, he didn't want to do it. So we've never interviewed him since then because we can't you know, because he did something like that and we just don't want to give a voice to that. So we just yeah. haven't interviewed Phil Anselmo. Was that five years ago, six years ago? Yeah, five like years ago, yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, I mean, that's that's where we stand. We haven't interviewed him because mm. he never really answered for it. Um, I think he did do something online in another music magazine. Um, and he, I think he did apologise after about kind of three, three attempts of people kind of saying you need to apologise. Mm. Um, but it's still kind of unclear really where he stands. Um, but Philly's, I thought you said something really interesting just about law and kind of metal musicians, um, because there are a lot of these kinds of myths. And I think some of the myths are sort of obvious and some of them are less obvious. And I know like, it's interesting for me when you're kind of mentioning, uh, I think Lena, you're mentioning sexism. And when I came into, um, the kind of metal journalism world 18 years ago um I was kind of learning about like all of this stuff and finding it all out and there was um yeah there was a lot of stuff that I didn't really know about and kind of had to find out about and I just kind of I don't know just kind of took it all as like normal and then you kind of look back at issues of old magazines from about 10 years ago and there's loads of kind of sexist stuff in it. Mm -hmm. You can look back and there's a caption about, you know, somebody's knicker drawer or there's a photo shoot with women who have all taken their clothes off. And, you know, I'm not approved by any stretch of the imagination for sure, like celebrate that <laughs> side of things. But 
Um, it's just interesting to me personally, kind of thinking that at the time I was just like, yeah, this is all just how the male world is. I just didn't question it. Mm-hmm. And 10 years on, you're like, wow, I was trying to survive as like a 20 something in that world that m- might have seen me as a woman, as this kind of person. And I think metal's changed a lot and it will change and people are having conversations, but it's kind of, that was interesting to me to sort of observe that from my own metal journey, as it were, that things can be so embedded that you don't realize that you're kind of participating in something um, that you think is normal or that is good, but it's not necessarily normal and good. And I think that's, people are probably having a lot of conversations with themselves now about some of the things we're talking about, uh, or, or, you know, we all should be about what is and kind of isn't acceptable. Yeah, I think yeah, the couple are more- see, Eleanor, this is, this is happening everywhere, not just in metal, in the music uh, industry at large, you have, you know, conversations like that and the film industry, etc. Uh, sorry, Philly, you wanted to say something. No, 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 all good. No, I'm, I'm interested in what you had to say. It's just, I, I agree. And I, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up as an avid reader of back issues of Crying and Metal Hammer and, and stuff. And, you know, when, when you look back at them now, they are just awash with crazy stuff. Um, the it's, world changed. Know, <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a shift in cultural mores, I think is the word. Um, and, you know, hopefully for the better, um i think that we are in the bigger picture i think we're in the middle of a period of real flux as people try to adjust to being decent to each other um in a world where anyone can say anything they want and theoretically be heard i think that has really caused earthquakes in how people relate uh which we're seeing at the minute you know i think an extension of that for better or for worse is cancel culture for example um you know where there is a kind of trial by public opinion and, you know, all this kind of thing. Um, so I think what's happening in heavy metal is a reflection of what's happening outside metal. One of the things, as I, and I'll say it again, one of the things I like about heavy metal is even while we adjust our attitudes um, and, and rephrase who we are as a, a sort of a, as a genre and stuff, I love that heavy metal still has the freedom to be completely mad. Like you can still write lyrics about anything you want. It's a genre where it's completely normal to write lyrics about murdering people. And most people just get that that's a story. And I think that's great. <laughs> you know, I think it's great. It's, it's Stephen King, the music. And uh, I, I love that about it, you know, and I love the, I love the friction in heavy metal and I love the aggression and the passion. In it. And, and like, I, I think it's completely compatible to still be the genre of music for mad bastards and outcasts and to be decent to people because those two things Set absolutely side by side in all the best heavy metal people's hearts, you know. Indeed, uh, you know, very well said. And you know, um, if if people are looking for inspiration, they're not familiar. Um, seeing Dee Snyder back in the eighties on the Senate hearings um, versus the PMRC, it's absolutely inspirational. Him and Frank, Frank Zappa, you know, just speaking on you know the, the the need to protect the freedom of self expression and you know the reasons why things like you know rock and metal should be protected. But isn't it interesting again? how parallel this conversation runs with the national and international debate, the one of deplatforming, you know, the one that, you know, says that, well, if you, um, if you deprive people of access to a website, you're limiting their freedom of self-expression. Mm-hmm. And, you know, those things are kind of, you know, dangerous. Now, um, you know, we talked, you know, previously about, you know, Phil Anselmo, uh, you know, and so on. And, and I guess that's the thing is, um, do we give people, you know, um, a right to reply um, do we give them an opportunity to evolve? You know, um, Lena, you mentioned redemption as well. Clearly, we are in an evolving genre. We are in an evolving society, you know, one that's continually surprised and startled at the ugliness that's dredged up, you know, when events like what happened in the U.S. Capitol, um, I don't think it's because they're unique. It's because it's such a common view, but we're not accustomed to seeing it in the United States, mm. um, you know, and so on. Is there is there a point where we allow people an opportunity to redeem themselves? I mean, uh, it, you know, once they have done something or whatever else, they say, you know what, I was wrong. It was a different time. It was a different place. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the main things, one of the main dangers of the inter- internet, the way it works at the moment, is it doesn't allow for the reality of personal growth and change. Um, you can say something, and that may not be who you were yesterday, and it may not be who you'll be tomorrow, you know? Like as, as with everybody born in the 1980s in a place that was, you know, like Northern Ireland where I'm from, you know, variety was basically that there were some ginger people there, you know, like, would I want everything said back to me when I was 17 and an idiot? 
you know what I mean? Like that's, it's not a true reflection of who I am or who anybody else is when they grow. I, I, you know, I, I'm very conflicted, particularly in, in the events of the last week about deplatforming. I do believe you shouldn't offer an opportunity, say at institutions and events that offer legitimacy to views that are injurious to liberty and, and people's happiness. Um, for example, like speaking at universities and, and things like that. I think there is there is obviously still room to hear out assholes, <laughs> but uh, you know I think there is a very clear argument around don't give people a big platform that makes them sound like they're real. Farage on the news every single day during the Brexit thing when he actually didn't hold any real position. But I think um, you know the, the kind of the social and digital platforms that we're seeing and the kind of purge that has taken place, particularly around the removal of Donald Trump. And it's not as if like every other lefty I didn't go ha ha he's not on Twitter anymore. But I mean think about it, we are living in a situation now where the president of the United States, one of the most powerful countries in the world, is dependent on a privately held platform and website for the bulk of his communication. That communication for good or ill has been leveraged and has done its damage and probably has done its, its good as well. But he can be removed by the stroke of a pen by a private company who can completely affect the real politic of his country and the communication. I think there's something... There's, there's it, this, this situation, as Alex and I were discussing recently, exposes a, a kind of a cultural and legislative gap that has happened because the internet has galloped ahead so fast in what it can do. The world doesn't know how to keep up with it. So we're in a situation where you can turn off the American president like C-3PO. And I, you know, I, I disagree with him completely, but like, is that healthy? Like at, at what point, at what point is, is that the only use of that super weapon? Like, can it only be used in that situation where we don't agree with that racist guy? Like, look at how it's applied in other countries, like in Asia. That same that same tool is being applied to people who fight for human rights. You know, women trying to um, get the right to drive in Iran. The same thing is happening to them. Uyghurs in China, that's happening to them. So, like, I think it's an extension of a thing that we should all be quite queasy about. Anyway, that's that's me. Yeah, just just to clarify, the women driving was in Saudi Arabia, not Iran. Saudi Arabia, sorry. But uh, yeah, but I mean, you you you're right. It is it is a platform. But at the same time, I'm someone who, um, I mean, I, I used to, in a previous career, do a lot of work on, on, uh, on the media. And I don't think we should blame the medium. Um, and I don't think Donald Trump necessarily needed to use Twitter. He just chose to use it in that way. Um, he had other avenues that he could have used. But this happens to be the tool of the century <laughs> so far. Um, and he's just using it. And in the past, people, you know, would have used whatever uh, communication tool was available to them at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but I know what you mean. I mean, the, the, the line between private and, and public and how things can be abused is, is you know, is a whole other um, issue that one, uh, one can talk about. But yeah, it can be used for good. It can be used for evil. Um, but I don't think we should focus on the social media as the driver. I think the key thing is human behavior and human behavior will find ways to express itself, whether um, it's good or bad. Um, so they, these are my, my two cents um, on, the, on the issue. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is a, please go ahead, Elnor. Sounds like you're- oh, <laughs> I mean, I was just going to say he's still the most powerful man and he's got other outlets that he can use to put messages out there that are going to get easily spread, even though I obviously do take your point. Um, I don't know. I think deplatforming can be really useful in instances where people's lives are at risk. That, you know, it's a big deal. Um, equally, I've heard of stories of people who had extremist views and have renounced them and have actually gone the other way and started to do kind of... Um, good work and sort of try and address or like right the wrongs of their past. And that can be extremely powerful if it's somebody that someone previously looked up to taking actions um, and causing them to reflect on themselves potentially and um, question what they've been through as well. You know, that could be another powerful way. Yeah. So, you know, so this is, a, I think it's a really good point and it, it, it dovetails very nicely on where, um, with a question that um, Tony on Facebook asked us. Um, you know, so um, how do we protect audience members from the abuse of power a large platform can give an artist or a band 
without using cancel culture and without preventing someone from an opportunity to evolve from their mistakes, which I guess it echoes what's been said, but it also asks, I think, an important question as well. Because as you know, we're talking about with deplatforming, you know, C3PO flick of the switch is what Philly called. Um, appreciate Star Wars reference. The um, you know, the thing is, is is there is there a medium there? You know, I mean, you know, I, I'd posit that perhaps what it what things need is they need moderation, you know, they need policing, they need monitoring, and they do need community, you know. Um, I mean, I guess that's what we're kind of doing here in a way, because, you know, um, I was startled and upset, you know. Um, I own Ice Earth Records. I don't know if I'm ever going to play them again, you know, because I won't be able to look at them the same way again. And, you know, we don't have enough time to get into like a deep, uh, you know, uh, kind of critique of, you know, art and can you separate the art from the artist and all that. That's a separate conversation. But it does make you examine, gosh, you know, so I can resonate with the creation of an artist, you know, whose politics I completely disagree with. That is a worrying thing because it doesn't make you focus on the artist. It makes you focus on what you see in the mirror as well. And so I guess that's mm -hmm. something that highlights the need for these sorts of conversations, you know, these sorts of transparencies. But again, um, you know, can people kind of move on? Can people come back from this? That's a question that I think only time you know, will tell, um, you know, but there's no question the internet has complicated our lives. Social media has complicated our lives in ways that we're only slowly seeing the, um, you know, the effects of, I mean, Lena, in, in, in your work, at, you know, Chatham House and all that, I mean, just like, I mean, how big a part does the, the, the web, do you think, play in radicalization? It's, it's the, uh, the old question. Um, it keeps coming up again and again. And um, as I was saying before, it's just the tool of the era. In the past, people used whatever you know tools were available to them. And it's not just radicalization, it's also propaganda. So for example, in Iran uh, in the 70s, uh, when there was a Shah uh, in Iran in charge of the country, uh, there was an exiled cleric called Khomeini who was in France. And the way he circulated his anti-Shah uh, speeches was on cassette tapes and people would just swap tapes a bit like heavy metal kind of you know people in the 80s used to swap tapes and that's how um, he spread his propaganda which led to the Iranian revolution of 79 which sadly led to Iran becoming a different kind of dictatorship so it moved to, from a secular dictatorship into a religious dictatorship so he used cassette tapes because that was the tool of the day just like at the height of ISIS which is something I looked at uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, carefully. Um, they use the internet because this is this is the available tool. So I don't think that it's the medium that radicalizes. I think it's what you use it for. Um, and uh, yes, people spend time on the internet quite freely and and easily, and it makes it more accessible um, to these people who intend to radicalize others. So I always go back to, um, you know, the, the medium as just being the space in which people get together and engage in activity, both good and bad. And at the same time, I have to say some of the more interesting people I've met in my career are people who used to belong to extremist groups. And here I'm talking mainly about Islamist extremist groups and who changed their minds completely, gave that up and decided to dedicate the rest of their careers to doing good. And so for me, yes, not everyone, to be honest, is, is going to engage in redemption and, and change their minds and become a force for good. But it does happen. And I think we should be open to that. And I think one of the dangers of cancel culture is the absolutist uh, stance it takes, which is that's it, you're done, you're over, you have no chance of ever saying sorry and, and rethinking your actions and coming back. It's like, that's it. And I think, you know, we should all take a nuanced view towards everything. Um, and of course, in incidents like uh, John Schaefer's, I think the rule of law prevails, obviously, yeah. first and foremost. And we shouldn't forget that as well, that we do exist in, in, you know, in a world where there is such a thing as the rule of law. And that should apply to actions. But I would draw the line when it comes to making an equivalence between an act of uh, criminal intent, like the one he engaged in, and say, violent lyrics written by a metal band mm. just for, you know, 
the hell of it just for fun. <laughs> so, yeah. so this is the danger that I see in, in, in cancel culture and in taking an absolutist stance that says anything that crosses the line is out. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we need some nuance and to kind of take a deep breath before we, uh, we judge people. Yeah, I think, you know, not, not to pull the Northern Ireland card out, but being from where I'm from, uh, you know, if you grow up with any political awareness in the last half of the century, I think, you know, yeah, yeah, you, there's a very clear narrative there that people can change, um, you know, <clears throat> extreme political views, violent political views and action can actually lead way to, to more progressive things. I remember a real political awakening for me was I went to a BBC event in Belfast when I was a college student and I saw David, David Irvine speak, not David Irving, David Irvine, who was um, the leader of the Progressive Unionist Party at the time. He had been a UVF member in his youth. He was somebody from a completely um, different background to me and, and, you know, political persuasion and everything else. I found him utterly convincing. He, he was much more convincing than the leader of Sinn Féin, who was on the same panel as him, because he could understand the position that needed to be fought against in order to create unity. And I think that's very important. Yeah, I think, you know, the, one of the telling things about cancel culture, and I'll stop flapping my gums in a second, is, you know, uh, while it is, um, perf while it is sometimes or quite often performity, uh, performatively a quest for, um, I don't know, uh, justice or, or restitution, I, a very interesting thing I noticed last year, and I joked about it at the time, but I really meant it was once, once the lockdown happened, cancel culture disappeared. People became self-interested. They became more naked about their self-interest. Cancel culture was largely and remains largely, apart from maybe things like Me Too, where there is actually a, an imbalance being addressed you know, with, with specific examples of abuse. Largely, it was people piling on in order to look like they were, uh, in order to look like they were the one who had the correct, uh, you know, the, the correct mindset, and that vanished when people suddenly became concerned about their own health and their own well-being. And I think that says a lot about it. You find me somebody who got cancelled in the middle of last year. It didn't happen on a massive scale because everybody was at home just worrying about themselves, and that says a lot. So, cancelling doesn't fix anything. It doesn't fix anything. Mm -hmm. Should should people be slapped around the head for being an idiot? Absolutely. But uh, I, I think there are, there are now multiple instances of people who probably should have been given an opportunity to redress and grow whose lives were ruined by that happening. You know, it's not all Harvey Weinstein's out there. And I think that's a dangerous thing. And again, I think it is part of this spasm we're going through culturally at the moment. And it's, I assume, something that'll probably be left behind within the next 10 years. I think one of the really difficult things is um, when you were just talking about sort of the internet um, and cancel culture, but. Um, Lena was talking about cassette tapes and, um, you know, the dissemination of information. And I just think it's so hard in the times that we live in, because although I can totally see where you're coming from and it not necessarily being the medium, it's the message. There's so much we don't understand about the way technology is used and so much that goes on behind the scenes. And you look at stuff like Cambridge Analytica. Um, and I think that is such a problem because... There are people, um, I think maybe you, Alex, said, you know, people, if you don't, or maybe it was Philly, you know, if you don't have the kind of um, awareness of what you're reading and what's happening to you, it's so easy for something to take off. And, you know, we don't have the regulation, we don't have the know-how, and um, the people who are kind of lawmakers don't even understand how technology works half the time. Mm -hmm. And without having that base to go from, it makes it really difficult Um for people who are trying to engage with things and learn about things and have conversations. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think, you know, when you talk about cassette tapes, that's kind of an extension of the, the printing press in that it, it could be democratized as long as you had the equipment to reproduce it. I think, you know, when you talk about US presidents having other means of communication, there were, there were a plurality of outlets with different affiliations and different outlooks and different models in print journalism, in television, in radio, uh, I think what we're saying at the minute is there's a total lack of plurality. There's monopoly on the part of about literally four or five white lads um, who control these platforms, which are policed in ways that I don't earnestly believe even those businesses have real line of sight over. They're, they're all too busy pretending that they're not publishers and that they're mere conduit, as they say. I think, it's, I think there is something particularly dangerous about the way the internet works now because they can turn the tap off. They don't really know why they have it on apart from to make money. And even they aren't really aware of what it can be used for. And I think, I don't know, I think there's something scary about that. I would not take away from Lena's expertise on this, though. Uh, she, she oh, does. no, not at no, all. A bit, a bit more than me, then. <laughs> not at all. I just think it's e even scarier, I guess, is what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah, you know? yeah absolutely. It's easier yeah, to I understand 
there's something <clears throat> physical in it is something that you know has boundless parts to it yeah I, I agree indeed well i mean there's no question that social media has transformed the way that information is disseminated if anything perhaps it's amplified problems that have been there for a very long time indeed you know ones that have manifested you know um you know in you know the last year you know just in the states you know as a consequence of decades and centuries of oppression suppression etc and so you know in many ways these are political movements that have precedent that far far um preceded you know, the advent of the internet, but as Lena, I think rightly says, it's just the latest tool, right? You know, and so I, I guess, you know, we haven't answered all the world's problems, but we have certainly managed to frame some of the most important questions, certainly in the metal community, um, which I guess you could say probably apply to society as a whole as well, you know? So, um, you know, if anything, we've kind of come full circle and uh, I just wanted to thank Eleanor and Philly for joining us. Um, so, Round Robin, you guys going to be watching the inauguration tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, I'm just glued to the news 24-7, you know, so uh, yeah, probably. I mean, it's it's always kind of boring though, isn't it? Um, you know, it's, it's, Not so, tomorrow. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's true. Tomorrow's will be like the spicy inauguration. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Indeed. Yeah, I reckon so. I think the whole world will be watching it really. Indeed. Well, you know, uh, well, well, may, may it happen safely. You know, if anything, I guess these events have probably highlighted, you know, um, a term that we all, you know, take for granted is, is just what a peaceful transition to power actually means, I guess, because for a moment, at least it seems to be threatened. And I guess, you know, fingers crossed it all transpires safely, you know, at least for the world of metal, you know, it's nice that we can have these conversations. They're important ones. That's what World Metal Congress is all about. And um, it's all about the people that join us and enter into dialogue. If you like what you saw tonight, I'm speaking to everyone who might be watching, go to worldmetalcongress.org, sign up to the newsletter. Philly and Eleanor, thank you so much once again for your time. Thanks so much, thank guys. guys. Real pleasure. Thank you, guys. Be well. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. I will place you into the waiting room. And uh, well, Lena, you know, um, what a stimulating conversation and, uh, you know, I, I have to say I'm just so thrilled, not just because of what we were able to exchange on screen, but also just like this absolutely bubbling chat that's been happening throughout the, the conversation on YouTube as well. Really interesting questions and, um, you know, just like importance. I feel like I've learned a thing or two tonight. Well, yeah, I mean, I also learned a lot and it's always interesting to hear different perspectives. And that's something that we welcome. I mean, we're not going to have answers to everything in, in an hour, but at the very least, we managed to put all these issues on the table and um, begin a conversation with the people on chat, the people who are watching, the people who hopefully we're going to bump into in, in physical life once we're able to. I think the conversation does not stop with the end of this episode, but um, let's just hope we've made even a small contribution to the debate. Well, you know, uh, I, I I think I fully agree, uh, you know, with with everything that you said because um, this is what WMC is all about. It's not just celebrating this music; it's also at times asking the hard questions. You know, um, that that's what it's meant to do. Um, not just pat ourselves on the back, but also, I guess, because we care about this music, we want to see it continue to thrive. But in order to do so, I guess we have to you know, look ourselves in the mirror as well sometimes. So uh, an interesting conversation. We'll have more webcasts soon, more stuff up on the website. Um, do sign up to the newsletter, Lena, an absolute pleasure to see you um, over there in Lebanon and indeed on Zoom. Be well.